You're listening to On Shifting Ground. I'm Ray Suarez. Less than 24 hours after the deadly helicopter crash in Iran, the International Criminal Court said it will seek arrest warrants for the leaders of Hamas and for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. In the days since, Norway, Ireland, and Spain, in a symbolic move, said they would recognize a Palestinian state. As the heat continues to rise on Israel, it's also putting the Biden administration in a tough spot. While U.S. officials are more publicly criticizing Israel's military strategy in Gaza, the president cannot cut support for Israel. Former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates is no stranger to the tough calls leaders face on the battlefield and in politics. Secretary Gates served in defense and intelligence under eight presidents. He became Secretary of Defense during the George W. Bush administration in 2006. He retired from government service in 2011 after receiving the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Barack Obama. In mid-October, he came to San Francisco, and I spoke with him just days after the bombing in Gaza began. We're revisiting that conversation because he predicted what Biden is going through right now. Secretary Gates, welcome to On Shifting Ground. Thank you. We have to begin in Israel and Gaza. Uh, The U.S. has a security relationship with Israel, but I bet a lot of Americans don't know what's in it. What are America's obligations to Israel under the terms of existing agreements? Well, it's been a while since I was in government and reviewed those agreements, but I think basically the security arrangements we have with Israel commits us to provide military assistance to Israel in the way of equipment. It does not commit us to commit American troops. In a bilateral relationship like this, is there a lot of give in the language? Can agreements be read broadly or narrowly? Yes, but my experience has been there really has not been any quibbling over the obligations the United States has had to support Israel. It was widely speculated that Prime Minister Netanyahu, to a degree unusual, I think, in the relationship going back all the way to 1948, favored a Trump re-election. When Joe Biden was vice president, Republicans invited Benjamin Netanyahu to speak to the Congress to denounce the JCPOA, the agreement meant to slow Iran's nuclear program. President Biden was critical of Prime Minister Netanyahu's judicial reforms. When the chips are down, you could argue the two countries always support each other. But when there's a difficult relationship or a difficult history between the leaders at the top, can it complicate the work, even with a relationship as old and as close as this one? Ray, I worked for eight presidents, and I think the angriest I ever saw all eight of them at one time or another was with respect to Israel. <laughs> and, and whether it was West Bank settlements or frustrations in a peace process or anything. And I'm talking about President Carter, who did the Camp David uh, Accords. I'm talking about first President Bush, who did the Madrid conference. Uh, and, uh, and it's a relation. It's almost like a family <laughs> in the sense that the two are very close. And when the chips are down, they're there for each other. But in diplomacy and in kind of day-to-day things, there's a lot of frustrations in the relationship. And and maybe it's because there is such a strong foundation of the relationship that they can afford to disagree or bicker when some of these other issues come up. But whether it's the U.S. coming to Israel's assistance in 1973, whether it's now— The United States has always been there for Israel when it counted. I mean, if the past is prologue, you will fairly quickly begin hearing a variety of voices, probably mainly in Europe, calling for a ceasefire, calling for Israel to stop. My own guess would be that the Biden administration will be willing to give the Israelis a lot more time than virtually anybody else. There is a piece of this in terms of regional strategic importance that I think needs to be said, and that is, I think it's important to understand the benefit to Iran 
of what Hamas has done. First of all, there's no doubt in my mind that the Iranians trained, armed, probably gave strategic and tactical guidance to Hamas. Whether they knew the exact date of the attack or not, I think is kind of immaterial. They had to know that Hamas was preparing this attack and probably helped plan it. I'm going to get a little extended answer here, but the problem with the reconciliation in the Middle East is that the Arab peoples, according to almost all the polls, are far more negative about reconciliation with Israel than their governments are. And, I mean, overwhelmingly negative. And I think this is probably true even in Saudi Arabia. And I think the longer that operation goes on, the greater the likelihood of mass protests in a lot of Arab cities that will bring pressure on those governments to the degree that the reconciliation between the Gulf states, including Saudi Arabia and Israel, is delayed or potentially even reversed. That is a strategic victory for Iran. And frankly, I think this war, one of the reasons that Iran would welcome what has happened is because of the potential to produce that strategic reversal of a development that was very much against Iran's interests. And the other question is how soon and how strident the demands of Arab governments will be for Israel to stop its operation, as opposed to the Europeans and others. But some of the resulting problems are a little counterintuitive. I mean, along with the opening channels between Riyadh and Tehran was a closer relationship between Iran and Russia and Saudi Arabia and Russia, Saudi Arabia and China. There were rumblings about a fairly broad-based turning down the heat in the sort of Sunni-Shia rivalry in that big stretch of land that goes all the way from Tehran to the Gaza Strip. A lot going on. Why would this be in Iran's interest? It's kind of hard to figure it out. They were, on some levels, ready to come in from the cold. Well, I think that the reconciliation between the Arab states, the Sunni Arab states and Israel, did present a long-term strategic threat to Iran. Yes, there was a turning down of the temperature between Tehran and Saudi Arabia. But I think there, the irony is I think the reconciliation between Israel and Saudi Arabia was far more advanced than any reconciliation, if you will, between Saudi Arabia and Tehran. Now, I think the big strategic gain for Iran is disrupting this reconciliation that was going on. And it is complicated. And we end up talking about a almost somewhat different issue strategically <clears throat> when we talk about the relationships with Russia and so on. Biden is the third American president to demonstrate that the United States was pulling back in the Middle East. And guess what? The Arab leaders believed and so, in my view, they were all hedging their bets about the United States pulling back in terms of being a security guarantor for them against Iran. And so all of them were hedging. So the leaders, over the last two years, there have been more visits to Moscow and Beijing by the leaders of the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Israel than there have been to Washington, D.C., so I think that this outreach to Russia and to Beijing has been part of a hedging strategy to keep all the channels open as far as particularly the UAE and Saudi Arabia, but interestingly also Israel. One fairly sotto voce response came from Vladimir Putin. He didn't seem particularly uh, pressed about the fact that there was now a, a full-scale war unfolding in between Israel and Hamas. This Hamas attack is a gift to Vladimir Putin. It distracts the United States from Ukraine. It has the potential to divert military supplies from the United States from going to Ukraine and instead going to Israel. It takes the world's attention off of Ukraine, 
So I think this is all to the good as far as Vladimir Putin is concerned. The more trouble for the United States and its allies, the better. But the world doesn't get to handle its problems one at a time. Ukraine is still trying to push Russia out of the land in the east and the south, occupied long before the full-scale invasion. And the Black Sea may be getting militarized. That This must be a little disturbing for you to watch. Well, it's not surprising given the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And again, I think the lack of a U.S. and European, anybody's response to the invasion of Ukraine in 2014 was a heck of a signal to Putin. The Ukrainians in 1994 signed an agreement with the United States, the United Kingdom, and Russia that guaranteed their territorial integrity in exchange for them giving up 1,800 nuclear weapons. That agreement didn't do much good for Ukraine. And when Russia violated that agreement, that 1994 agreement, 20 years later, in 2014, the unwillingness of the West to do anything as a consequence other than a few sanctions, pretty telling in terms of a security assurance to a country. What was really on the menu in realistic terms in 2014 that wasn't tried, wasn't contemplated? Well, I wasn't in government at the time, so I don't know what all. But what, what, what would be on a, on a well, possible you could have, menu? Well, you could have imposed the same kind of sanctions in 2014 you imposed in 2022, which were pretty dramatic sanctions at a minimum. But security guarantees to Ukraine? providing military equipment to Ukraine, starting training then of Ukrainian forces. There are a lot of things that could have been done. The stopgap spending plan that keeps the American government operating in Washington only passed because Ukraine aid funding was taken out to be dealt with sometime in the future. For all Ukraine's success on the battlefield, is this a perilous moment in the diplomatic battle space. I don't think it's a, as perilous a moment diplomatically because I don't think much is going on diplomatically with respect to Ukraine. I think it is a perilous moment in terms of Ukraine's confidence that the West will have its back and that the United States will fulfill the commitments that President Biden has made to them to be with them as long as it takes. I think that's his quote. And the inability of our Congress even to elect a Speaker of the House, much less pass a military appropriations bill, which hasn't been done before the start of a fiscal year since 2010, simply signals the paralysis in our own government at a time, I think, of significant international peril. On that unsettled state of congressional leadership. Are defense and national security matters in the modern context so heavily centered in the executive in the U.S. that the president of the day, whoever it is, has a lot of freedom of movement in national security matters and Joe Biden has time until the GOP figures it out? Or is this a real practical problem for the administration going forward? When it comes to the movement of forces, the president has a great deal of leeway. But when it comes to money, he has no leeway. And the Pentagon, despite the enormous size of its budget, has extraordinarily little flexibility in how it spends that money. Virtually all of it, except for a tiny, tiny percentage, is specifically allocated to specific tasks. And anytime you want to reprogram any of that money, you have to go to four committees of Congress to get approval to reprogram $10 million, $20 million. So within the framework of an already approved budget, congressionally appropriated budget, the president has very, very little flexibility to move money around and to take it from one program and allocate it to another without the consent of Congress. My wager would be that particularly the Ukrainian leaders, both military and civilian, are very nervous about what happens to the pipeline from the United States. The Europeans can make up some of that difference, but not very much and for not very long. So it really matters to the Ukrainians whether 
that pipeline from the United States remains open. Has Russia's failures in Ukraine made Russia even more dangerous? The joke goes that the invasion has taken the Russian army from being perceived as the second most powerful in the world to the second most powerful in Ukraine. That may be, but does it also carry with it the threat of a more reckless, less constrained Russia? I think that depends a lot on what happens with respect to the United States and the rest of NATO. As long as we're supporting Ukraine, given the fact that we have strengthened our NATO capabilities in Eastern Europe, in Poland and the Baltic states and elsewhere, with the addition of Finland and potentially Sweden, Russia is in a much weaker strategic position now than it was two years ago. And the problem that Putin faces is that his conventional capability has been significantly degraded, particularly if you're contemplating taking an action against a NATO country, which would put you at war with NATO. And the problem that he has is that while he has 1,900 tactical nuclear weapons, the truth is it's hard to find a useful purpose for them that in any way is commensurate with the political price you're going to pay for using them and potentially the military price. They have a very limited area that they would destroy. You could use several potentially and sort of have a no man's land to parts of Crimea from Ukraine. But on the battlefield, they're a tactical advantage. That's why they're a tactical nuclear weapon. They're not strategic. They're not going to change the outcome of the war. But here you have Putin's closest buddy, Xi Jinping, publicly twice warning him not to use nuclear weapons. And even Putin has kind of backed off of some of his rhetoric in that regard. His deputy national security chairman, Dmitry Medvedev, talks more wildly about using nuclear weapons than almost anybody else. But Putin's been pretty cautious. Because the truth is, if he were to use nuclear weapons, even tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine or any place else for that matter against NATO, that becomes a very different story. But more importantly, I think it creates real problems for China. I think it knocks India off the balance beam. I think India has to react in a very negative way. I think a lot of the global south will react in a very negative way. So countries that have sort of been trying to balance between Russia and the United States and Ukraine, I think would be forced to take a position more hostile to Russia. So the consequences of the one military option that he has beyond where he is in eastern Ukraine, I think in many respects, I won't say it's an unusable one, but the consequences are extraordinary and far outweigh whatever he might gain. Secretary Gates, great to talk to you. Thanks a lot for joining us on Shifting Ground. Thank you. You've been listening to On Shifting Ground, produced in partnership with KQED, with funding from listeners like you. Today's episode was produced by Elise Manukian, Adam Ailey, and Andrew Stelzer. Additional production and engineering were provided by Rob Spade. KQED's Jim Bennett is our technical supervisor. Jared Sport is our executive producer. Philip Yun is co-CEO of Commonwealth Club World Affairs. Our music is from Blue Dot Sessions. I'm Ray Suarez. Thanks for listening. 